Well, it's that time to look to the Lord in prayer as we prepare for His Word. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your goodness to us. We pray that you bless this time of study in your Word. And Lord, I pray for comfort where comfort is needed, encouragement where encouragement is needed. We commit this study to you and pray that your Holy Son and His Holy Spirit will be working to glorify your name. That is above every name. We commit this uh, time to you and understanding that you are in control of all things in our lives. And we bless you that you are good, good Father. These things we pray in the precious name of Jesus our Lord. Amen. Well, someone has said, our more modern world has committed murder. By trying to live without God, it has killed love. Millions today no longer look for satisfaction through a loving relationship with God and other people. For these people, life revolves around themselves, and they are busy seeking their own fulfillment. You know people like that, and I know people like that. This fascination with self-interest has even invaded our churches, our Christian world, as, as a look at content, at, as a look at current books will show us. An analysis by Arthur James Hunter of the eight most prolific conservative religious publishers revealed that 87.8% of the titles dealt with subjects related to the self, its discovery and nurture, and the resolution of its problems and tensions. The remaining 12.2% of the titles had to carry the rest of the cargo. We who believe on Jesus Christ must be aware lest we fall into preoccupation with self that marks our culture today. Our calling is to love with all our being the God who first loved us and to love others as ourselves. This is a pathway to a joy-filled, satisfying life. The New Testament letter of 1 John repeatedly calls on believers to love one another even as God has loved them. For example, it states, Beloved, if God so loved us, loved us, we also are to love one another. So this brings me to the main idea of the message God has given me today to deliver to you at this crucial time in your life and my life. So please, I want you to listen attentively to it, not just with your head, but more importantly with your heart, where the Holy Spirit is ready and resolved to plant the seed of God's eternal and enduring truth in order to do what? In order to change and conform born-again believers among us here today, more into the glorious image of Jesus Christ, the Lord and the leader of the church, and to call and convict unbelievers of their sin of unbelief graciously and gently leading them to genuine repentance and personal saving faith in Jesus Christ, who is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. So here's our message in a nutshell. Please, I implore you humbly to once again pay very close attention to it with an open heart and an open mind, willing to hear it and hear it. Here's the message in this simple statement. God's selfless and sacrificial love for born-again Christians sets the standard for the love they are called to embody and express to their fellow Christians. To put it simply, Christian love must be self-sacrificing like God's love. In other words, believers have the obligation of following the pattern of God's sacrificial love. That is your obligation and that is my obligation. Folks, friends, faithful followers of Christ among us here today and fellow believers in the fold and flock, fellowship and family of God, the Bible is going to freshly and faithfully remind us today that the true nature of agape love is unselfish and sacrificial. It is not preoccupied or consumed with I, I, me, me, self, self. 
Rather, its consuming passion is to seek the welfare of others. It will also firmly and forcefully reveal, reveal to us today that it is through believers that God's love is demonstrated to the world today. Do you know, listen carefully, that the only way the love of God is made known today is through the lives of genuine born-again Christians who represent God here on this earth? Say, Christian, has the love of God been made known through you today? Because that is what we are going to see in our message today. So please, if you have your Bibles, quickly turn them to 1 John chapter 4, verse 11 to 14. Will you please listen carefully as I recite our passage of study from the updated New American Standard Bible, which is the most literal translation of our Bible into our English, of the Bible into our English language. The Bible says in verse 11 of 1 John chapter 4, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this, we know that we abide in him and he in us. Because he has given us of his spirit. We have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. We have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. This is the word of God to the people of God. May the Lord add his blessing to the recital of his holy word. We have before us today a passage of scripture which can accurately be described as a passage of love. If you want to know a lot about love, get to 1 John chapter 4. It has a lot of love to give you. <laughs> and it has a lot of love to give me. First of all, it is a passage of love because it affirms God's love for believers. I tell you, friends and fellow believers, God loves to affirm his love for you and for me. In a brief but blessed statement, the Bible affirms God's love for you and me who believe in, the, in his son, Jesus Christ. It says, if God so loved us. But please understand that this statement does not express doubt. And I'll be explaining that later in our message. Second, it is a passage of love because it accentuates the Christian's obligation of following the divine pattern of sacrificial love. The Bible will emphasize for us today that the Christian, the Christian love must be self-sacrificing like God's love for him or for her. And then third, it is a passage of love because it attests that since no no one or no man has seen God at any time. The only demonstration, listen carefully, of God's love in this age of ours today is the church. That is born again Christians. Believers like you and me. So these are the reasons why our passage of study today is a passage that can be accurately described as a passage of love. Well, having just whetted your spiritual appetite, please allow me today to give you a brief overview of how the Holy Spirit has prepared me to present his message to you in this passage from start to finish. First of all, we will emphasize the Bible teaching, the Bible's teaching focusing on the practice of love in verse 11. Using a term of endearment in addressing believers, John, through the Holy Spirit, affirms God's love for believers, including himself, and then urges them to practice love patterned after God's love for them. Second, we will examine what the Bible teaches about the perfection of love in verse 4. The Bible will teach us that when believers practice, when believers practice loving one another, the love of God is perfected in them. So the question to be answered today is, 
What does the perfection of love mean in your life and my life? Well, with the help of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Scriptures, we will answer this question in a moment. Third, we will explore the proof of God's abiding presence presence in Christians in verse 13. The Bible has made it clear that no man or no one has ever seen God at any time. And since we cannot see God, what evidence has he given of his presence in Christians? I can't see God. So what evidence has he given me to know that he's present in my life? Believer in Jesus Christ, what is the proof that Christ is abiding in you today and in me today? Well, with the assistance of the Spirit and the Scriptures, we will address these questions in the course of our study today. And then fourth and finally, we will expound on the Father's purpose of sending His Son in verse 14. Through the Holy Spirit, John repeatedly described declares to us the Father's purpose of sending His Son. Why did God send His Son into the world? Did He give us His reason for sending His Son? Well, in chapter 4, verse 9, we are told that we are told God the Father sent His only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through Him. That is, receive eternal life. And then in chapter 4, verse 10, we are told that the Father sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sin. That is, to be the satisfaction or the atoning sacrifice for your sins and my sins. Now in chapter 4, verse 14, the Bible reveals another of the purposes of, of the Father's purpose of sending His begotten and beloved Son. So the question is, what is that purpose? How important is that purpose for our world today. Well, keep listening attentively because the Holy Spirit wants to teach us something from that. Well, having given you a concise overview of our passage of study, let's now dig deeper into it to discover the precious and practical spiritual lesson, the lessons the Holy Spirit is desirous and delighted to impress upon our hearts in order to do His supreme and supernatural work of making and molding us more like Jesus Christ, who is our rock, our refuge, our redeemer, our restorer, and our righteousness, and our ruler in this present life and in the life soon to come. We begin, first of all, by emphasizing his teaching, focusing on the practice of love in verse 11 using one of his favorite terms of endearment in addressing born-again believers in Jesus Christ, John, through the Holy Spirit, first affirms God's love for them and lovingly urges them to practice love, patterned after God's love for them. So the Bible says in verse 11, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to what? To do what? Ought to love one another. First of all, by using the term, the term of endearment, beloved, which John employs six times in his letter, chapter two, verse three, uh, verse seven, chapter three, verse two and twenty-one, and then chapter four, verse one, seven, and eleven. Three times he used it in chapter four. He is giving evidence that he himself has been mastered by the love he calls, he calls for. He's expressing that love. He's just telling the people, love one another. But before they will do that, John gives them an example by the way he addresses them. Beloved, dearly beloved ones. In other words, John is seen here practicing what he preaches. And that's what I desire for my life. By the grace of God, I want to practice what I preach, not just preach and not practice. Now, please understand that the expression, if God so loved us, does not express doubt. Because it says, if God so loved us. Sometimes we think that that is an expression of doubt. But you ask, 
How so? How do you know that this is not an expression of doubt? Well, please listen carefully. In the original statement, in the original, this statement is called a first class condition, in which the speaker assumes that the condition stated in the if clause, also called the protasis, is a reality. That is, it is true. So to get the full force and meaning of what the Bible is saying here, in the if in the if clause, the if clause should be rendered as follows. Since indeed God so loved us. That's what John's readers understood him saying. Since indeed, he's not expressing any doubt in their minds. He's affirming the love of God. He said, since indeed God so loved us. So the Bible is actually affirming God's agape love for believers. How did God love believers? Well, John had earlier given believers a twofold concrete description of the display of God's love for them. First, selflessly, God sent his only begotten son so that redeemed believers might live through him, experiencing eternal life. Then secondly, sacrificially, God sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And so the Bible is saying Christian love must be self-sacrificing love just as the Father's God's love is self-sacrificing. In other words, since God so showered, lavished, and bestowed his love on those who are now his people, we also are to love those who are members with us in the blessed and beloved family of God. Our love for our fellow believers, the Bible is saying, must be based on God's love for us. That is how you should love, and that is how I should love. I should not love with my own standard. I should love with the standard that God has set for us. I should pattern my love after God's standard. That is what the Bible is teaching us. So that is to say that God's self-sacrificing love sets the standard for the love all true Christians are called to embody, to express, and extend to their fellow Christians. John says, since indeed God so loved us to the extent of giving his only son, we ought to love one another. He says, we have a moral obligation to love our fellow Christians, patterned after the love of God. John by the Spirit says, since God loves us so selflessly, so sacrificially, we are bound to love each other because it is our destiny to reproduce the life of God in humanity and the life of eternity here in time. This is our moral obligation as believers in Jesus Christ, loving one another. So please listen, God sending his son gives Christians not only salvation privilege, but obligation to follow this pattern of sacrificial love. It is as if John is saying, you, by believing brothers and sisters in Christ, you have experienced the love of God. And you are still experiencing the love of God. You have enjoyed the love of God. And you are still enjoying the love of God. Therefore, embody this life. Express this life. Extend this life. And exude this life to others in the family of God. You see, the false teachers were not at all concerned with any moral obligations. Aside, they did not practice love. But the Bible says that is not to be the case in your life and my life as believers in Jesus Christ. We must commit ourselves to the practice of loving one another, patterned after the self-sacrificing love of Almighty God. A love that is unselfish, unfailing, unchanging, and unconditional and I'm ending. So please understand that the Bible is not talking 
about the cheap sentiment which many people entertain today as love. In fact, the word for, for love is the Greek word agapao, which speaks of the highest form of love imaginable. A love that seeks the welfare of the other, even at a great, great cost. Commenting on this verse, Bible commenta commentator F.F. F. Bruce writes, quote, God's love for us then supplies the motive power for his people's love for one another. We also ought to love one another because we are, we are his children. If the children of God must be holy because he is holy and merciful because he is merciful, so they must be loving because he is loving, not with the mast of external compulsion, but with the mast of inward, inward constraint. God's love is poured out into, the, into their hearts by the Holy Spirit whom they have received." Unquote. So believer in Jesus Christ today, are you aware of God's love for you today? When you woke up this morning, did you have a sense of God's love in your life? If so, are you allowing the Holy Spirit the freedom to express and to extend God's love through you to others today? It is told of John that when he was very old and too feeble to walk, he would be carried into the gathering of believers and in speaking who always say, little children, love one another. It is the Lord's commandment. What a legacy John left for us regarding the practice of loving one another. Well, years ago, the story is told of the father who sat at his desk pouring over his monthly bills. When his young son rushed in and announced, Dad, because this is your birthday and you are 55 years old, I'm going to give you 55 Kisses, one for each year. How sweet, little boy. When the boy started making good on his word, the father exclaimed, exclaimed, Oh, Andrew, don't do it now. I'm too busy. The youngster immediately fell silent as tears welled up in his big blue eyes. Apologetically, the father said, You can finish Later, the boy said nothing but quietly walked away, disappointment written all over his face. That evening, the father said, come and finish the kisses now, Andrew. But the boy didn't respond. You see, a short time after the, that in, this incident, the boy drowned. His heartbroken father wrote, If only I could tell him how much I regret my thoughtless words and could be assured, and could be assured that he knows how much my heart is aching. You see, love is a two-way street. Any act, loving act, must be warmly accepted, or it will be taken as a rejection and can leave a scar. If we are too busy to give and receive love, we are too busy. John says, you have received God's love. Therefore, you must commit yourself to the practice of giving God's love. Love is a two-way street. Have you practiced the giving of self-sacrificing love today? Because every day God is giving you and you have to give. Every day God pours his love into my heart and I have to give that love. Well, having emphasized the practice of love in verse 11, the Bible now brings us to the point of examining what it teaches about the perfection of love in verse 12. Would you please notice the profound statement the Bible is now about to make to us about the perfection of love. It says what? No one 
has ever seen has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. Literally this verse reads, God no man has ever has no man ever has beheld. If we love one another, God in us remains and the love of him having been perfected in us is. Notice that God is in the in the emphatic position in this verse that is at the beginning of the verse. He's the one no one has ever beheld or seen. Now some people challenge that statement that no one has ever seen God by pointing out scriptural illustrations of those who have seen God. They point to Adam and then Moses who talked with God face to face and was hidden in the cleft of the rock as God went by. They also point to Isaiah who says in Isaiah chapter 6 verse 1, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne, lift high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. They speak of Ezekiel who had visions of God as well as Daniel, and others to whom the Lord appeared. So, no one has seen God at any time. What about these people who reportedly have seen God? Well, please listen. These men saw what is known as a few funny. That is to say, God manifested himself in some form to those men, but, listen carefully, he did not reveal himself in all his fullness, in all his majesty, in all his glory and splendor. So the point is that no human being has seen God in all his fullness and glory. We are waiting for that day. No one has seen that glory of God in all his matchless majesty. Actually, John had already made this statement in the beginning of his gospel in John chapter 1 verse 18. He says, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the fa Father, he has explained him. So, John's point is, is that no human being has seen God in all his glory and fullness. In this verse, that is John chapter 1 verse 18, the Bible is telling us that the invisible God has been made known or explained in his son Jesus Christ. You see when Jesus was when Jesus walked on earth he was veiled in human flesh. So much so that the multitudes did not know that he was indeed the son of God. So John's statement that no one or no man has seen God at any time in all his fullness is still true today. So what's the point the Bible is trying to teach us in this verse? Well, here's the point. The, Bible, the point the Bible is making here is that no man or no woman has seen or beheld God at any time in all his glory, in all his splendor. But God today can manifest himself through believers loving each other. In other words, now that the Son has returned to the Father God, to the Father, God is made known on earth by those who through faith in his Son have become children of God if they do what? If they love one another. Do you know that the love of God displayed in his believing born again people is the strongest witness that God has in the world today. How awesome that you and I who are believers in Jesus Christ must be, the, must be God's answer to the world's need to see God. Most people want to see God and probably they will never see God revealed in all his majesty. But they can see God when we display love to one another. So please listen. 
Now that Jesus is no longer in the world as he was when he came as the God-man to manifest the love of God, the only demonstration of God's love in this present age of ours is you and is me, the believer in Jesus Christ. So the Bible's teaching in this verse can be stamped up as follows. Since no one has seen God ever, the only way he who is love can be seen by his believing, can be seen is by his believing born again children loving one another and thus showing the family likeness. John reminds believers love originated in God, was manifested in his son Jesus Christ and must now be demonstrated in his people. What a privilege. What a responsibility as well. You see, friends and fellow believers in Jesus, the God whom no one has ever seen is seen in those who love one another. Please listen. When believers show divine love, people come as close to seeing him who has never been seen by humans, humans in all his fullness. The Bible goes on to say, to mention two spiritual blessings that flow out of our love for one another. First is God's permanent presence in us. That is why the Bible says, God abides in us, or remains in us, or lives in us. And since the present tense abides or lives is used here, it reassures believers that God's presence in them is permanent. It is not temporary. The second spiritual blessing is the perfection of God's love in believers. That is why the Bible says at the end of verse 12, and his love is perfected in us. The verb translated perfected is teleo. Teleo. It also means to complete, finish, accomplish. In a passive voice, which is how it is used here, it means to be made perfect or complete only in the sense of reaching one's prescribed goal or reach one's goal. So what does it mean? His love is perfected in you and in me. And in me. It means, listen carefully, it means as believers love one another, God's love accomplishes its full purpose in them. It means God's love reaches full expression in Christians when they love one another, their fellow Christians. It means when his love is planted in our hearts and he, will, he himself dwells within us, his love reaches its prescribed goal in our lives. It means God's love has achieved its desired purpose in our lives. It means God's love is growing and maturing and developing to make a difference, to actually developing to its fullness in making a difference in our world. You see, we are never intended to be what? Terminals of God's blessings, but channels. This means God's love is given to us, not that we might hoard it for ourselves, but that we, it might be poured out through us to others. When we love one another, the invisible God reveals himself to others through us, and his love is made complete or perfect in us. But having emphasized the practice of love in verse 11, having also examined the Bible's teaching regarding the perfection of love in verse 12, the Bible now brings us to the point of exploring the proof of God's abiding presence in Christians in verse 13. The Bible is going to make it vividly clear to us today that when we love one another in the way described for us so far, that is proof that we, we are in God and He in us. Will you please listen carefully to what the Bible says in verse 13. It says, By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us because He has given us 
of his spirit. Notice the Bible begins by saying, by this we know. This is John's way of saying to us, if we love one another, we have proof of God's abiding presence in us. What then is the proof of God's abiding presence in you and in me? In other words, what convincing evidence has God given believers of his abiding in them? Is the proof a solid proof that doesn't change with time and with culture? Or is the proof subject to the changing times and cultures in which generation after gener generation of people live? Is the proof dependent on our emotions, on, on our feelings, which are unstable most of the time? Well, please listen. The proof God has given believers of his abiding presence in him is not of his abiding presence in them is not dependent on our emotions and our feelings. Sometimes my emotions can deceive me. <laughs> and you know that <laughs> very well. <laughs> but God didn't give me a proof of his abiding presence dependent on my emotions, how I feel. It is not subject to the same changing times and cultures in which men live from generation to generation. Rather, it is a solid and strong proof that doesn't change with time and culture. That is why the Bible confidently and convincingly says he has given us because he has given us of his spirit. You see, since we cannot see God, he has given us evidence of his presence in us through the spirit who dwells within when we become genuine born again Christians, one of the promises the Bible tells us we receive is that we receive the Holy Spirit. He comes to stay in our lives. This means that God's presence in our lives is proof that we really belong to Him. And this Spirit also gives us the power to love one another. So the Bible is teaching us here that the presence and activity of the Holy Spirit within Christians are evidence that they are abiding in God and God in them. You see, the abiding is actually reciprocal or mutual. God abides in us and we abide in God. This is the wonder of wonders beyond belief. John first mentioned the reciprocal abiding in chapter 2, verse 24. He now mentions it again in chapter 4, verse 13. And he will speak of it again one more time in chapter 4, verse 15. So this concept of reciprocal abiding or mutual abiding, God in us and we in God, is so important to John. He's telling us in chapter 4, verse 13, that it is possible only through the gift of God's Spirit by whom our blessed relationship with the Father and with the Son is sealed eternally. Reciprocal abiding makes possible God's love for us and our love for Him. It is also the reason we can love one another. So please listen, the proof God has given you is the Holy Spirit. And since the verb has given is in the present tense, it means that the Spirit has been given and remains given to the genuine born-again believer. That is to say that the Holy Spirit remains permanently, not periodically given to you on Sundays or during Bible studies. It remains permanently in your life and my life as a believer in Jesus Christ. Bible commentator F.F. F. Bruce shares this enriching and enlightening insight on this verse. Quote, not only is God's love poured into his children's hearts through the Holy Spirit, an appreciation of God's truth has been imparted by the same Spirit. The Spirit of love is the Spirit of truth. 
The Spirit persuades and enables us to believe in Jesus as the Son of God. He communicates to us the new life which is ours as members of God's regenerated family. It is through Him that we remain in union with the ever living Christ and He with us." Unquote. How gracious, how glorious that God has permanently given His Spirit as proof of our abiding in the ever living Christ and He in us. So believer in Jesus Christ, do you often pause to ponder and marvel at Christ dwelling in you and your dwelling in Christ? That is a blessing beyond belief. I can't fully express this or understand it. Finally, the Bible brings us to the point of expounding on the Father's purpose of sending His Son in verse 14. Why did God the Father send God the Son into the world? Well, the Bible, the Bible's clear and convincing answer is found here in verse 14 for us. It says, we have seen and testified that God, that, that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Glorious statement. I tell you friends and fellow believers, this is a grand, great and glorious statement of God's love in action. You can say that this is another summary of the gospel of God. You and I, or you can, and I can, begin sharing the message of the good news with this, with this summary statement. God has sent, or the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. If we have to wait till we know everything in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, we will never share the good news of Jesus Christ. By the grace of God, I read through the Bible every year, and I began this practice in 1990. And I'll be lying to you today if I say I know everything in the Bible. But the little that I know, God motivates me to share that little. The Spirit leads me to share the little that He has taught me. So this statement emphatically tells us that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, is the Savior of the world. Actually, the expression the Savior of the world occurs in John's writing only here. And in John chapter 4 verse, the Gospel of John chapter 4 verse 42, where those blessed words came from the lips of the Samaritans. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 15, we read of Paul's statement regarding God's purpose in sending Jesus into the world. It says in verse 15, it is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners among whom I am foremost of all. So, notice in John chapter 4 verse 14, the Bible tells us the Father has sent the Son. The Greek word for send is apostello. We get apostles from this verb. It means to send forth on a certain mission, such as to preach, speak, bless, rule, redeem, propitiate, or save. The expression that Jesus was sent by the Father denotes the mission which he had, he had to fulfill and the authority which backed him. The authority of the Father was fully backing Jesus Christ. So please listen, the importance of this mission is denoted by the fact that it is his Son that God sent. You can say that Jesus is the greatest of all missionaries. He's the greatest of all God's apostles sent to carry out God's divine mission of saving sinners like us. Earlier in 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, John speaks of Jesus Christ as the propitiation for all the world. Now he ascribes the widest scope to the saving purpose of God. 
Jesus came, listen carefully, not only to save Jewish sinners, but also what? Gentile sinners like myself in every tribe and tongue and nation and people of our world. Bible teacher W.E. Vine describes the boundless scope of Christ's work as follows. Quote, the scope of his mission was as boundless as humanity, and only man's impenitence and unbelief put a limit to his actual effect, unquote. Now, an important question as we bring that message to a close, an important question to answer at this juncture is, to whom does the pronoun we, stated emphatically in the original, refer in the phrase, we have seen and testified. Well, this was particularly true for the apostles like John, who were Jesus' hand-picked witnesses. In other words, we certainly refers to all those, especially the apostles, who had direct knowledge of Jesus' earthly life. But it probably ought not to be limited, limited to them. By extension, and through faith, all subsequent believers testify to the same truth. We too do see by faith that the cross lifted up in Jerusalem was for our sins and for our salvation. We too do see in Jesus our, our, our own Savior and Lord. We too do see in the fellowship of faith the presence of his love in us. And because his spirit in us gives us this same experience, we are commissioned to bear witness to Christ. Therefore, since there is such a con close connection between seeing and testifying and the gift of the Holy Spirit, John meant his words to include his readers as well and to be applied to all Christians now as well as in the past. Dr. McGee shares this insight on this verse that sheds more light on our role of taking Christ to a world of lost sinners. He writes, quote, this is the gospel witness. This is the message which we have, we have to give. This is the purpose of our love. Again, I must come back and repeat, Christian love is not sloppy or sentimental. It is not sexual, it is not social, it is something that you it is not something that you have at a church banquet. It is something which reveals itself when we take Christ to a lost world of sinners. That is the way we manifest our love unquote. So how does this message apply to you today? Well, if you are already a genuine born again believer in Jesus Christ, this is how it applies to you and to me. In total dependence on the Holy Spirit, remain committed to a life of what? A lifelong practice of loving one another. Second, realize afresh that the strongest witness God has in the world is you. You, since no one has seen God ever, the only way he who is loved can be seen today is by Christ followers like you and me loving one another. Then third, remember today that God is abiding in you and you in him. He has given you a solid proof to assure you of his dwelling in you and your dwelling in him. That is the Holy Spirit. Do you have the Holy Spirit in your life? Do you rely on the Holy Spirit in your life? Do you listen to the Holy Spirit in your life? And do you follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. Remember we sang, He leadeth me. Well, the Holy Spirit is the one who leadeth us. Fourth, reach out to others and share the good news that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Now, if you are not a, a genuine born again believer in Jesus Christ, may I humbly say to you today that you need to be saved from yourself, from your sins, from your stubbornness of heart, from Satan, who has come to steal and to kill and to destroy. You need to be saved from your ungodliness and unholiness. You need to be saved from 
your fears, your failures, your follies and frivolities. You need to be saved from your bondage. You need to be saved from your wretchedness, your waywardness, your wantonness, your willfulness. And please today, Jesus is, list, is offering you salvation. He's the savior of the world. That includes you. Simply what? Come to Jesus just as you are. With all your fears, with all your failures, with all your sins. Confess to Jesus today that you are a sinner in need of his salvation. And then call upon the name of the Lord Jesus today with simple and sincere faith that he died on the cross for your sins, that he was buried to put away your sins, that he rose again from the dead on the third day to bring you into a right standing with God. And the Bible says you will be what? Born again to become a child of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your love for us. No one has ever loved us like you. Help us to receive your love, to embrace your love, and to express that love to members in the family of God and beyond. And we will give you all the praise and glory. Now, Lord, I pronounce your blessing upon your people. The Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. And all God's people said, Amen.